bismillah. Well, firstly, thank you very much for having me um, tonight to talk about this topic. Um, I'm going to try and talk about me as little as possible and talk about conversion uh, in general terms uh, as much as possible, inshallah, if I can, um, for two reasons. One is um, that I think, um, well, I hope that, you know, there'll be a point in my life where I'll no longer be a convert. I'm seven years in and counting, still converts, hoping there'll be a point at which I'll just be Muslim um, and uh, still working to figure out when that boundary is. Um, the other reason is that I've been involved with um, a project with the Islamic Studies Department at Cambridge University, which is doing a fantastic study into converts. Uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the uh, findings. I can't talk in too much detail because the report's not been out yet, but there was a press release that I can discuss, uh, inshallah. So um, I'll start off by summarizing my own sort of conception of conversion. Um, and I think Plato got it right when he said, conversion is not implanting eyes, for they already exist, but giving them a right direction, which they have not. So that kind of sums up how I understand conversion and how it's been reflected in my own life. Now we know that conversion produces um, a mix of reactions in people around us, fear, suspicion, astonishment. It was only a few days ago that some of you might have, ca might have caught the um, Daily Mail headline of Al-Qaeda recruiting female converts. Um, so there's, there's definitely a lot of fear and concern as, co uh, as concerns converts. Um, and I think there is, uh, in particular, a lot of misunderstanding in a society where religion has um, ceased to be uh, a prominent part of the public sphere. Um, uh, concern as to why anybody in their right mind really would uh, wish to regress on what is assumed to be the sort of developmental spectrum um, and uh, start uh, including the notion of God into their world view. Um, so let's maybe start with a, a little bit of history. Conversion to Islam uh, by Europeans, of course, dates several centuries back. Um, estimated in a, the 15th or 16th century, there were about 300,000 renegades, as they were called now. Um, or, or they were actually referred to as Turks. That's what converts were referred to initially, um, obviously in reference to the Ottoman Empire. So when you became Muslim, you were turning Turk, you were becoming Turkish. Um, many of you would have heard of the famous British convert Abdullah Quilliam, um, who obviously set up one of the early um, British Muslim communities, set up the first British Muslim newspaper, The Crescent, which if any of you haven't come across, I very much recommend. Um, and his little community attracted 600 converts over 20 years. Um, and he's a fascinating character. If you've not looked into his life, I very much recommend it. Um, there's also another prominent group of converts that were associated with Woking Mosque, which was the first purpose-built mosque in Surrey in 1912. Um, and they published another interesting um, review called the Islamic Review, uh, which included many articles by converts. Um, and again, a really interesting insight, if you are interested in this topic, into how um, converts at different periods in history understood what it meant to convert and what they understood it to mean to be Muslim. For example, we know that um, uh, Abdullah Quilliam's community took a very gradualist, appro gradualist approach to things like drink and prayer um, and that the uh, women, for example, didn't wear hijabs as scarves. They used to wear sort of the hats that were much more typical of the era and which would have been less conspicuous, of course, at the time. Um, Coming to sort of more recent facts, um, according to the Scottish census uh, of 2001, there were 60,669 converts to Islam in the UK, um, and 55% of those were from the white British ethnic group. And there's a bre breakdown really in there. Um, uh, they've classified it along the lines of 16% other white and 29% non-white, which I guess is not a particularly good breakdown. It's white or non-white is a really quite a strange categorization. Um, uh, and actually, I think we'll, we'll come back to um, the topic, I think, of race, which I think is an important one. Um, the, the recent study which I mentioned to you 
uh, is a study called Narratives of Conversion to Islam in Britain uh, by the Centre of Islamic Studies at Cambridge. And it's, it's brought out a lot of interesting uh, findings even so far, and the, the report's not complete yet. But one of them is um, obviously many converts feel quite frustrated with a very one-dimensional portrayal of female conversion in the media, which is generally that women who convert tend to do so on the basis of marriage, which actually statistically is very much the minority. Um, it's actually a very few women who tend to convert for marriage, and the majority tend to convert for a, a number of other reasons, but um, uh, most of them uh, some sort of conviction-based research, um, and not, if you like, the caricature of... Um, sort of doing it to please the husband, which I think is, is unfortunate but widespread. Um, and of course the idea that many of them do convert at the expense of their independence and their liberty, and that again is very much a widespread uh, view, it, it's very much part of the public narrative. Um, and I think that's again what will be interesting when the report comes out, is that if you think about the, uh, the image of Islam in the public sphere, you'd think that sort of liberal-minded intellectual women from non-Muslim backgrounds would, you know, run a mile from Islam. But actually, when you start to encounter um, Muslim converts, you tend to find that um, a, a noticeable number, at least, are well-educated, um, intellectually engaged. Many of them have got um, high-flying careers. Um, so the question then, obviously, is, is why? Um, uh, and I think, obviously, there are a, a plurality um, of reasons for that. But there are actually, there's actually no evidence to suggest that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. Sorry to disappoint. Um, we don't actually know that. Uh, and I think, actually, given um, just how much negative press Islam does receive, it's likely that that's not true. Um, it's... What is true, and this is from the, com uh, the, the statistics that we can get from things like the census, um, is that as many as three quarters of British converts, um, so an estimated 100,000 between 2000 and 2010, were female. So um, statistically speaking, um, these guys on the panel are a minority. Uh, just wanted to point that out. Um, <laughs> So when we're thinking um, about converts, we can talk a little bit about um, the experience that, that converts have. And, and they are quite diverse, but there are uh, some points that we can draw out. Um, a number of converts get their information and assistance from books, um, Muslim acquaintances, um, and the Internet. Uh, and a majority say that they receive no help from the mosque, which I think is... Um, a sad indictment, actually, of our mosques and of the role, really, that they ought to be playing within the Muslim community in terms of a support network, in terms of a hub for the community, in terms of a hub. When I say of the community, I don't just mean of the Muslim community. It should be a hub where, um, you know, the homeless, the elderly, people who are vulnerable in the community feel that they can come to. It's somewhere that certainly people who've just converted should feel welcome and it should be somewhere where they get support and help. Um, the majority of converts um, do experience a bit of a hard time, certainly initially, um, and these difficulties can range from uh, negative attitudes of the family and people around them, uh, but also difficulty in identifying with the Muslim community. Um, I think, uh, recalling my own experience, certainly the minute you decide that you want to convert, and of course conversion in Islam is relatively easy, you know, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, and bam, you're Muslim. But, uh, you know, there's a lot more to it, obviously, than that. And um, there is this sort of assumption that as soon as you've taken the shahada, that that's it, you're, you know where you're at. Um, and, and that's when the questions start to flow. What are you? Are you Sufi? Are you Salafi? Are you Sunni? Are you Shia? What are you? We want to know. Well, I don't know. I'm just Muslim. That's, that, that's only as far as I've got. Um, and I think, uh, and actually we could go further with those questions, are you dear Bundy? <laughs> we, we could go a lot further with those questions. Um, so I think uh, converts then become, if you like, um, almost um, a prize to be won over by the different communities. So uh, which mosque are you going to attend? Are you going to attend the, the Pakistani mosque or the Arab mosque? You know, who's going to be your clique? 
Um, and, and you have to uh, somehow find your way uh, in this kind of uh, pull from different directions. And I think that's another thing that um, um, Muslims find difficult, certainly in the early stages. And I think um, one of the issues then becomes if you do identify with one of those communities, how do you retain your identity as a European if you're frequenting, let's say, an Arab mosque, uh, you know, and not become, a, you know, you don't have to become Arab to become a Muslim, obviously. Uh, but I think certainly converts in the initial phases certainly struggle with how do you find your identity as fully European and fully Muslim. Um, and interestingly, actually, the majority of converts feel that there's no natural conflict between being a devout Muslim and uh, being uh, a Briton or living uh, in Britain. And the majority also feel that there is more good than bad uh, about British culture. Um, so I think if you're interested in this sort of stuff, uh, there's a Faith Matters report, which I would very much recommend you look into. Um, and it's just got, I've just sort of read out a few of the stats off that, but you could find out a whole lot more there. Um, I certainly had the experience of um, what I call the racialization of converts, which is that um, you go from being um, solidly recognized as white middle class to suddenly being a little bit brown, a little bit something, um, you're definitely not white anymore, and suddenly realizing that actually there's a different relationship to um, people that aren't white and middle class <laughs> um, out there and that there are a lot of struggles um, even in basic interactions that uh, perhaps one was not completely aware of prior to that. Um, so I think the reasons why obviously converts uh, do decide to take the big leap um, are, are multiple. There are many. Um, certainly in the research that we've been looking at, there are those who um, encounter somebody very inspiring. There are those who um, come into contact with the Qur'an. Um, there are others like a good friend of mine who's um, Czech who was living uh, at home and decided to look into Islam on the internet and decided to convert based on what she read on the internet. Um, so I mean there are, there are really, um, really interesting kind of journeys that people take um, and they, they, are, they do vary quite a great deal. Um, one of the other things that really came out of the report uh, and that will come out of the report um, are some of the issues that um, Muslims, com Muslim converts from different backgrounds experience. So I think while there is generally a sense of triumphalism um, from heritage Muslims converting concerning white converts, I think converts from uh, black and Asian backgrounds tend to have a lot harder time and I think that's something as a community that really needs to be taken into account. Certainly a lot of the women who were participating in our discussions found that they were not afforded the same respect, welcome, admiration that were afforded to white converts, that if you were a black convert it was kind of taken, as gr taken for granted that you would convert, that you weren't um, uh, included in the community in the same way. And of course, once um, black and Asian uh, converts enter the community, they experience a whole other host of barriers, things like, oh, well, I'd like to marry your daughter. Uh, black convert man wants to marry Asian woman, and there are a lot of problems come up for converts from black and Asian backgrounds. And I think we can't gloss over those. We can't pretend that they're not there. Uh, one of the most horrific stories that I heard actually was of uh, somebody trying to organize um, a trip to Hajj and they were fundraising for it. And, um, and the fundraisers asked if they could see, uh, sorry, the, the finance, those financing the, the trip had asked if they could see um, uh, the profiles of those who were going to be sent off on the Hajj. And, um, and essentially, there were a number of black and Asian converts on the list, and they said, well, these aren't real converts. We're not prepared to fund them. Um, these things are happening. They're very real, and I think it's very important to be aware of them and to try and make sure that we don't um, somehow slip into, I guess, a complex surrounding um, white, white converts uh, as being somehow 
um, you know, different or in need of um, greater praise or recognition. Um, and I think it's worth asking ourselves that when we do give white converts that importance, what does that say about our view of ourselves? Um, so, and, and I suppose on the topic of converts generally, what I also usually point out is um, most practicing people, in a way, are converts. Um, most of you who are practicing have made a conscious decision at a point in your life to look into your faith and decide that that's something that you would like to commit to. Um, that journey may have been eased by the fact you were coming from a Muslim uh, background, or it may not, because sometimes that just complicates things a little bit further because there are all sorts of cultural issues tied into uh, coming from a particular background uh, and notions of what Islam actually means from the background you're coming from. So, um, in terms of my own conversion, uh, I, I encountered um, Islam or Muslims from a very early age. I went to school with many um, people from uh, a Muslim background. I went to a French school and so many of them uh, were from North African, um, uh, a North African background, Moroccans, Algerians, Senegalese. Um, uh, and then a few Levant, Levantines, so Lebanon. Um, and I think the uh, overarching uh, kind of image I had of Islam growing up was um, pretty much that the way that I'd been taught it in my philosophy class, which was, um, Staffelah, to quote my philosophy teacher at the time, uh, Jesus and Muhammad were imposters. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty much how my philosophy teacher taught us, um, you know, what religion was, what it was about. Um, and, and of course, you know, in a sort of enlightenment driven education, you're very much taught that uh, religion is a relic. We've moved on from that. It's a delusion. It's something that holds people back from sort of full mental emancipation. Um, and that, that is really the image that I had up until uh, the time that I went to university. Um, and I went to university between 2000 and 2003. Um, so, of course, September the 11th happened um, whilst I was at university. And, um, and there was a, a, a massive shift, actually, on campus, a, a palpable shift in, on campus, and a palpable shift in the way that my friends were suddenly being referred to. So while previously I think that they'd been known as Moroccans or Algerians, they were suddenly Muslims. Oh, the Muslims did this, or the Muslims did that. And Islam sort of became a lot more prominent in the way that we were filtering people's behavior. Um, and of course it became a great topic of discussion. Um, uh, what, is, what is Islam's place in Europe? What kind of an influence is it having in our society? Um, is it positive? Is it negative? Um, who are these Muslims anyway? Um, and for me, the real sort of turning point, I guess, was um, I developed a friendship with um, uh, a number of Muslims at my university who were, who were devout and practicing Muslims. And they were the first devout and practicing Muslims that I'd ever encountered. Um, and they helped me shift the way that I thought about religion on a number of fronts um, and not by giving me overt dawah, believe it or not. <laughs> they helped me shift my understanding of religion by being really nice people, <laughs> really good people that you could rely on, really um, uh, reliable, generous, um, timely, um, <laughs> yeah, and, um, <laughs> and generally uh, just people who I suppose when you're a student and you're the first time at university, you need a, a, a network of people to help you get on with life. Mum and dad aren't there anymore to, to help you. Um, you start to value those qualities in people. And I started to un question why it was that these, you know, these people in particular had these qualities and what it was that was cultivating those qualities within them. And you know, they would explain that you know, in their religion this is something very important to um, help your neighbors, look after your friends, be there for people if they needed you. Um, and so I started to shift my view of Muslims, not so much of Islam, um, just by virtue of an interaction with people whom I felt had um, very solid um, ethical 
uh, ideals, and, and I respected that. I didn't respect the religion. I didn't. Um, I continued to, to view um, Islam as something negative, but I, I, I respected them, and that was the beginning, really, of a, a window, I think, into the religion. Um, the other big turning factor was um, somebody giving me a book by uh, Oriana Fallaci, who's an Italian polemicist, and she's dead now, actually. And she wrote um, a book uh, in which she described uh, Muslims in Europe as um, vermin, and we all know what you do with vermin, um, mangy dogs, um, and we all know what you do with a mangy dog. Uh, and, and really there was a language being used in, in, the, um, in the book which worried me. It really echoed with some of the literature that I'd grown up reading. Um, um, and I, I was concerned, and I felt that it was important at that point for me to become educated enough about Islam that I could determine whether what was being said about it, you know, was it this nefarious influence in, uh, in Europe? Were Muslims trying to take over and, um, you know, create this t horrific system? Or, or were Muslims being talked about in terms which was wholly unacceptable? And did I therefore have a responsibility as a human to get involved and make sure that this was stopped because either way I didn't feel that I could be neutral at that point anymore. Um, and so really uh, the journey began but I suppose I should point out the other thing that really had a, a big influence was the, um, the Senegalese ladies that I uh, was friends with um, and they really shifted my view of Muslim women. Uh, they were not me nor were they shy and retiring. Um, they were quite the opposite. And they uh, shattered a lot of my preconceptions and they forced me to question a lot of my prejudice um, by virtue of who they were, by virtue of being sassy, smart women who knew why they were doing what they were doing and could hold their own in an argument as to why they were doing those things. Um, and so that, those were, I think, I, if I had to bring it down to three factors, um, some of the key elements which then led me to start looking um, into the faith a little bit more deeply. Now, of course, um, being uh, the sort of cantankerous person that I am, I went away and decided I was going to read this Quran to prove them wrong. And, um, and I went home and uh, picked up a, a free... Uh, copy of the Quran that I'd been given at my local mosque, which was an awful translation. Um, awful. Sometimes I think you can do more harm than good with some of the translations of the Quran that we hand out. Parenthesis closed. Um, and, uh, and, well, and went to read it in a fit of anger, like, right, let's, let's show these guys what's wrong with this text. Couldn't get past the first page. Just couldn't. Couldn't read past the first page. Just couldn't, couldn't read it. I, le I left it for a while and, um, and went away and uh, summer exams came and went, summer came and went and uh, as, as students suddenly some, sometimes do, became a little bit bored over the summer holidays, decided I would raid my dad's library um, and uh, came across a French translation of the Quran that he had um, and, and read that and that completely blew my mind. <laughs> I was uh, very much struck by, uh, by the Qur'an. It very much spoke to me in terms that, uh, to me, I can't really explain in any other way than to say it's a book that obviously is not a book. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a message contained within some pages, but it's, it's also uh, both universal in its reach, but very specific in its ability to speak to your heart at a particular point in time and address very specific issues. Um, and, and for me, it was a, a very moving um, experience. Um, I'm aware that I probably have about three minutes left now. So um, uh, I'll try and wrap up. Um, I, I should also point out that part, as part of this debate and discussion that I was having with the Senegalese sisters, I was trying to convince them that um, uh, you know, the, this oppressive clothing that they were wearing, it was really time to, to shed it and to um, start living in the 21st century uh, and discover all there was to learn about fashion. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we started to have a, a really interesting discussion um, about 
uh, about well, we didn't, we didn't call it modesty, actually. Uh, we would have a discussion about what it meant to be empowered as a woman. And, uh, and one, of, one day they suggested, well, um, because, of course, their argument was that if you minimize the attention you place on your physicality, you create a public sphere in which people are more equal because it's not about girls competing against girls for male attention. It's not about women competing for male attention. Uh, it's just minimizing the attention on the outward so that we can focus our attention on what's substantive, what's real. Um, and those are the values which really we should be putting all of our intellectual energy into. Uh, and those are the values that really should be dominating um, our public sphere. Um, and so they gave me, as we say in French, un gage, a, um, uh, what do you call it, like a, a dare, why don't you try it out? Um, why don't you try it out? Wear um, uh, not a full-on hijab, but I used to wear a little bandana and some baggy clothes. And to be honest, it's not so much the bandana. And I'm be honest, and the hijab for me, or the headscarf or the khimar, or <laughs> we know what we're talking about, the headscarf, um, is, uh, and I have said this before, that the, the cherry on the cake, you, you totally have a cake if you don't have a cherry, but you don't have um, a cake if you just have a cherry. <laughs> Uh, and so, and so uh, the idea was that actually the, I minimize this attention on the body by wearing clothing that uh, place more emphasis on, or force me to place more emphasis on m myself as a person. And, and actually seeing the reaction that I got outside, having to work a lot harder for things, um, it was a lot easier before, actually. Um, you know, if you didn't have the right bus fay, just flustered your eyelids and gave a little, you know, smile, flick of the hair, and suddenly you could get on the bus for free. Um, it doesn't work that way anymore, unless the bus driver is Muslim. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so I think it was it was a really interesting um, experience to uh, realise that actually, if you minimised um, the uh, importance that we attach to female sexuality um, as a tool of expression in the public sphere, you had to work a lot harder on yourself as a person. Um, you couldn't get away with things a lot easier. You actually had to be nice to get things done. It wasn't enough to just use your uh, wild charms. You actually have to work at things and be a nice person uh, and stick to your word because these are the things that matter ultimately and are going to, um, you want me to end, got it, um, that are going to help people uh, or that, that are going to make sure that people then respond to you in the way that you want them to respond. Uh, and for me, that was a very uh, empowering uh, journey to go through as a woman. It was one which I knew, even if I didn't commit to Islam, I was very interested in the notion of minimizing the importance of the female body as um, one of the roots for our expression in the public sphere. I, I really took to the idea that actually, from a feminist perspective, um, we have a lot more to gain from minimizing the attention to that and focusing on things that are much more substantive in our public interactions. Um, and of course we know in Islam the hadith that says God does not judge according to your bodies and appearance but scans your hearts and looks into your deeds. Well for me that's, that's a very empowering way of looking at the world and actually Islam is very much about that. Forget about your riches, forget about your background, forget about the way you look. Ultimately what you take with you on that day is the good deeds that you've put before you. Um, and there's nothing more equalizing than that. Um, so I wanted to talk about a whole load of other things. I have a quote here that says, the problem, uh, the problem is the 98% of men who give us 2% of men a bad name. I wanted to talk about that, but maybe we can keep that for the Q&A. Um, Q&A, someone. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, uh, thank you. All good uh, that came from this is from Allah and all errors are my own. Thank you for your time.